Okay, uh, today it's Midrash time. Uh, for some reason, uh, the other day it occurred to me, it uh, probably was a good reason, but I don't remember it. Uh, uh, we uh, were talking about Old Testament stuff, and I thought, hey, I got just the thing. Uh, I wanted to read you my version of the story of Jehu, the guy. Yeah, that was it. The, the, he's the one that killed all the uh, priests of Baal and so forth. Uh, let me just give you a teeny bit of background about this. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, a, a good uh, pal and collaborator, Ed Suoman, and uh, he and I wrote uh, the uh, book uh, Against Theistic Evolution called uh, Evolving Out of Eden. And um, Ed was uh, engaged in writing some stories about biblical stories, uh, but like redoing them and, you know, when modern narration and all that. And he uh, wanted, he was really disgusted by the character of Jehu who butchered all these prophets of Baal. And he wrote a story and I read it and I thought, boy, that, that's good, but I would have done it differently. And so I decided, why don't I do it differently? So uh, Ed had inspired me to do the same. And here's my Midrash, my uh, uh, retelling of the story uh, from a different standpoint. And I hope you will enjoy it. I think it's, uh, it's pretty good stuff. And uh, it does give a whole different outlook to something in the Bible. It's called the Savage Sword of Jehu. One, whispers from the shadows. But Jehu, my brother, how can you continue in the service of the witch queen? How can a man sworn to Yahweh pledge allegiance to that priestess of Baal and thus to Baal himself? I fear for your soul. With these tearful words, Tamar buried her face in the mighty chest of Jehu, weeping. Returning his sister's embrace, the guardsman Jehu raised his bearded cheek against her, rested his bearded cheek against her forehead and sought to reassure her. But I've told you before, I don't know how many times of my plan. I have worked my way up through the ranks so that I may find myself close enough to Queen Jezebel to strike and to dispel the shadow she has caused to fall upon Israel. This is the land of Yahweh Sabaoth, and he will not share his worship with another. Do you not believe me? Suppressing her sobs for the moment, Tamar replied, Of course I believe you, my brother, but great is the danger you face. King Ahab is a weak-willed child, putty in her hands. He has not lifted a finger to stop his foreign wife from spreading the cult of Baal where it does not belong. It falls to others to do it, and it will be done. The prophet Elijah has pronounced her doom already. The wild dogs will lick up her foul blood from the gutters. It is the will of the Almighty. Do you think he requires your sword arm to strike for him? Let God act in his own time. But that's just it, Tamar. The time has arrived. We, faithful remnant of Yahweh, dare wait no longer. For I have heard whispers in the palace that Jezebel is close to offering a final sacrifice, mustering the power needed to open the gate to Baal and to bring him from his cursed domain into our world. And I for one doubt if Yahweh will save us if we do not undertake to save ourselves. I tell you, do not worry, for it must be over soon, and the arm of Yahweh and the sword of Jehu shall prevail. Withal, the towering figure kissed his sister's tear-damp cheek and stooped so as not to bump the doorway with his head. He squinted as he left the modest structure with its thatch roof and emerged into the blazing morning sunlight. He had walked his way, baked by the sun's oven, his entire life. His hide was deeply bronzed, his black mane lightened to brown. 
His brawn was barely bridled by his guard's harness. As he neared the palace, he hailed a couple of his comrades coming off their shifts. Had you leaned very close, you might have heard something more serious than vacant pleasantries. Scant syllables, coded signals, portended great developments impending. Feigned smiles masked the subversive truth. In the very shadow of the palace roof lurked a gaunt, wiry form, almost as tall as Jehu. The figure's sudden whisper startled the younger man, a hard thing to do. Jehu caught himself in a flinch, then recognized Jonadab, well-known leader of the ancient Rechabite Brotherhood. Rumor made the old man much more than a sage. Many feared the sorceress powers they imagined he wielded. Jehu himself was not sure what abilities the old man might be concealing, but Jonadab was so imposing, even ominous a figure, that any wild speculation concerning him seemed plausible. He wore sackcloth gathered with a broad leather belt. He leaned on a gnarled, seemingly iron-hard staff, taller than his own spare frame. Its surface was inlaid with sigils, which might have glowed softly when in shadow, though Jehu could not be sure. Is your heart right with my heart as mine is right with yours? This is all the elder said. Jehu's only response was to clasp forearms with the other. Then he continued into the palace to assume his post. Standing to one side of the throne room door, he exchanged knowing nods with his counterpart on the other side. Two, Devil's Devotions. But the queen was not sitting on her golden throne. King Ahab slouched on his golden chair, the smaller of the two, and he appeared both bored and cowed. It had not taken long after his marriage with the Philistine princess Jezebel to learn, to his great chagrin, that he would henceforth be occupying the back seat. His hen-pecked plight did not earn him the contempt of his subjects, though. Instead, they seemed entirely sympathetic to him seeing in Ahab a fellow victim of his demon bride. Few suspected it, but their characterization of Queen Jezebel was no mere metaphor. They could not know what the palace staff knew, that on certain occasions, when the council or the signature of the king was required, their monarch comported himself in unaccustomed style. Some thought, without daring to voice it, that Ahab's bearing, his expression, the tone of his voice, were all reminiscent more of the queen than the king. On such occasions, the queen was nowhere to be seen being indisposed. But today, though Ahab was not accompanied by Jezebel, he did not manifest her steely haughtiness. His queen was about her business elsewhere. Of this, the Yahweh priests feared and suspected terrible things, unprecedented abominations. In those days, no one in Israel believed that their ancestral deity was the only deity. That day was yet a long way off. In the meantime, most believed that each country had the right to its own tutelary deity, even if only a totem. Their worship deserved respect from those whose countries served other gods. But Queen Jezebel had another philosophy. Great was her devotion to her native deity, Baal Melkart, and she was driven to spread his empire throughout her adopted land and her efforts were meeting with surprising success. How had she managed it? It was simple, really. Her Baal was a fertility god. The Israelite Yahweh was a storm god and a warrior. 
Queen Jezebel claimed that the greater the kingdom's devotion to Baal, the greater the harvests, the larger the livestock herds. And the people had to agree she was right. It was not that they were repudiating old Yahweh. They just felt that God, like themselves, could get used to a new arrangement with two deities sharing the nation's adoration. But there were some, perhaps many, who remembered that Yahweh was a jealous God. What form did Baal's worship take? It had its unique charms, for it was based on the magic of imitation. If a farmer desired to increase his chances of a good crop, he would visit one of the high places, the hilltop shrines, where he would patronize the attendant priestess, a sacred prostitute. As the farmer planted his seed in her receptive ground, Baal should inseminate his fields with his plentiful rains. Yahweh worship offered nothing like this. It was this seduction, this corruption, against which Elijah the Tishbite had railed. But there were deeper secrets, more shocking rites performed in the inner circles of Baalism. And that was the business that occupied the queen this day. Her husband knew nothing of it and wanted to know even less. Somewhere in a torch-lit cavern beneath the palace, you would have witnessed strange sights. The rough-hewn wall and smooth-worn cobbles underfoot showed very great age, perhaps from the days before the great flood. Even the queen did not know how her priests had discovered the place, but little did she care. The great depth and the tons of rock separating the chamber from the surface were all that mattered to her, for there was no danger of anyone hearing the screaming echoes of those being tortured and vivisected in Baal's name. These depredations were preparatory to the invocation of Baal planned for one midnight soon, when his impatience would end and he would cross over to this world from some foreign dimension unimaginable to man. Pain caused the veil between the spheres to grow thinner and thinner. Jezebel was busy fortifying her own powers because it took more than human energies to make the needful rites effective. Already her communion with the other side had endowed her with considerable potencies, but these she sought now to heighten to the ultimate degree. As much as her depraved priests relished their sadistic labors, few could resist a furtive glance toward the supine queen, for she lay gorgeously naked atop a pile of corpses, some human, some others hard to identify. Her sweating body jolted forth and back as one after another hulking figure took his turn mounting her, then pistoning her frantically, finally leaping away to make room for the next one. Closer attention than the priests dared give the spectacle would have revealed that the queen's rough lovers were not precisely human. Some had asymmetrical horns, some three arms of different lengths, others covered with scales or dense fur or both. At last, the exhausted, exhilarated despot found herself without her welcomed rapists, who seemed to have vanished into thin air. She sat up, wiping the blood from her eyes, nose, and ears. A pair of her priestesses rushed to her side, each bearing towels and unguents which they applied to her lacerated back. But in all this Jezebel felt no pain, only power. Her eyes showed it. They glowed like coals amid the shadows. 
The Baal priests, seeing this, formed a circle about her and fell prostrate. As for their queen, now their high priestess, she threw her head back and laughed. 3. The Sun, S-U-N, of Righteousness Miles outside the capital city of Samaria, the faithful of Yahweh were gathering on the plain. Though Jehu had summoned only the men of fighting age, he was gratif gratified to see that many had brought their families, showing how deeply the heart of his people was grieved by the growing corruption of the nation at the clawed hands of Queen Jezebel. On Jonadab's advice, Jehu had sent messengers even to Judah in the south. Jezebel had as yet no real influence there, but it required no oracle to see a short distance into the future. The curse of depraved Baalism must surely spread there next. Jehu's messengers had sought to convince the Judeans that the danger though still on the horizon, was real. But relations between the once united Hebrew kingdoms were always tenuous at best, and the princes of Yahweh were ill-inclined to undertake what must become a full-scale war. Nonetheless, a number of individual soldiers, zealots for Yahweh, heeded Jehu's desperate call. Many had managed to make their way to this gathering. They knew not Jehu by sight, but were enthusiastic in their welcome as he climbed an outcrop of boulders to address them. Jonadab joined him there. His strength obviously not diminished by age, he easily made the ascent. Already something of a legend, he was at once recognized by the crowd who quickly fell silent at his presence. The Rechabites nodded, uh, sorry, the Rechabite nodded but said nothing. Jehu too was silent as a third figure appeared. No one saw him making the climb, though surely he must have. At sight of this man, the multitude gasped in awe. Who did not know the prophet Elisha, son of Shaphat, by sight? He had once been the disciple of Elijah the Tishbite, but now was reputed to have surpassed him in deeds of power. Though Elisha made himself available to the faithful, journeying from village to village, hovel to hovel, none could predict his movements, and for long periods no one saw him. His legend grew as his own disciples speculated as to his whereabouts, whether in this world or others. But here, today, he was. The prophet of Yahweh, his bald pate reflecting the blinding sun, wordlessly took Jehu by his hilt calloused hand and pointed downward, whereupon the young giant knelt unselfconsciously before him. Still saying nothing, Elisha drew from the folds of his enveloping robe a small vial of balsam oil. Unstoppering it, he proceeded to pour the contents on the bowed head of Jehu. The crowd gasped again, perceiving all too well the significance of the act. As Elisha stepped back, the other wiping runnels of the oil from his eyes, stood erect, and Jehu lifted his face to the burning sun and flung his corded arms wide. By the one God of the Hebrews, I will drown the house of Ahab in a sea of blood and fire. For Temple of Nightmare the day arrived, and the conspirators were ready, as ready as they could be, though none really knew what to expect. There were guards posted around Baal's temple, several of them Jehu's men. Jehu was a captain of the royal guard, and he arrived early to inspect the troops, exchanging knowing glances with those he could trust. 
The temple was no great distance from the palace, and Jehu had various preparations to make for the great ceremony, necessitating several chariot trips back and forth between the two buildings, ferrying temple personnel and extra guards, transporting delicacies for the post-ceremonial banquet, and so forth. On the last such trip, he caught sight of Jonadab emerging again from the shadows. Looking around in all directions, he brought his team to a halt before the old man and extended a hand to help him into the chariot. Looking his patron in the eye, Jehu exclaimed, "'Come and see my zeal for Yahweh!' They arrived at the sprawling temple compound, now swarming with Baal's devotees as well as the merely curious and the many country folk hungry for any variation in routine. Jehu dropped the sage off as inconspicuously as he could. He handed the chariot off to the business-like attendants, who detached the cab from the team and led the weary animals to the stable. Jehu, resplendent in polished finery, took his place at the head of the guard detail. After tedious long minutes, the more vexing because of mixed anticipation and foreboding, they received the signal and began their measured procession up to the dais, while the royal party emerged through the doors behind the elevated platform. Jehu stood at attention at the side of Ahab the king, he very nearly did a double-take at the close-up sight of the royal couple's costumes. He had seen the king and queen plenty of times in their service, but never had they decked themselves out in such a manner as this. Their matching robes were so thickly encrusted with emeralds and rubies that it was impossible to guess the color of the underlying fabric. Each wore headgear that hovered somewhere between a crown and a priestly mitre. The sight was so distracting that Jehu scarcely noticed the uncharacteristic demeanor of both. Something was very much amiss. It only added to Jehu's foreboding. Things only turned stranger when Ahab arose from his throne and strode with unaccustomed swagger to the front of the platform. After sonorously pronouncing a formal invocation to the god Baal, the king announced dramatically that in order to actually summon Baal into their midst, they must needs offer the highest sacrifice, no mere human, but the king himself. At this, all present gaped as with a single mouth. Jehu was as astounded as anyone. He had not known what to expect, though he knew some dreadful thing must be afoot, and that it would be the turning point. He and his partisans would act, and may Yahweh give them success. Events were even now unfolding, nay, hastening to their climax. Jezebel quaked with terror as her husband allowed himself to be trussed up by the priests and laid on the altar. In a moment, it occurred to Jehu that such binding must be superfluous if the victim went to his death voluntarily. Jehu began to unsheathe his sword as he beheld the bound king convulse and commence screaming. Things were clear now. Poor Ahab had been displaced, taken over by his witch queen, who had abandoned his flabby form just in time to avoid the descending sacrificial blade. Ahab crumpled with a whip whimper, and the air inside the temple grew electric with new tension. The air filled with strangely hued auroras through which everything appeared unstable and distorted. In the midst of the dizzying chaos, the dimensional gate began to open to Baal. 
squinting at the eye-burning vista, Jehu thought he could make out a pulsating mass, which somehow seemed to be sentient, though no recognizable features signaled the fact. The priests commenced a peculiar limping dance, hopping from foot to foot while resolving at ever in, while revolving at ever increasing speed. In this way, they sought to enter an ecstatic trance, insensible to pain. Accordingly, as Jehu watched with disgust, the dervishes produced wavy bladed daggers and began gashing their bared limbs. The spraying rain of blood must have been intended as an offering to the awakening Baal. They chanted mantras of, Come, Lord Baal! Come, O Baal! The light in the place was changing again, getting dimmer and partaking of some unnatural spectrum. Jehu found himself passing into a dreaming state without awareness of falling asleep. He came to himself with a start and a light tap on the shoulder. It was Jonadab wielding his inscribed staff. As Jehu shook off the haze, Jonadab waved the staff to indicate the whirling cultists. Jehu nodded and sprang from the dais to begin cutting a path through the mass of nonplussed dancers. At the bite of his blade, as the bite of his blade awakened each one to his last moment of life, priest after priest dropped to the stone floor. As more and more succumbed, each fallen body made a splash in the deepening lake of priestly blood. By this time, most of the Baal priests had been awakened from their trance by the noise of the slaughter. Those farthest from the dais made for the doors, only to meet the thirsty swords of Jehu's men as the guards poured in from outside the temple. Those not in league with Jehu and Jonadab hesitated in confusion. What was going on? Why were their fellows attacking the priests? At first they supposed a party of assassins had slipped past them, attacking the priests trying to get to the royal couple, but no, it was fellow guards who were striking them down. Should they come to the aid of the few remaining priests? They stood frozen until distracted by what was happening up on the dais. Flashes, then blasts of brilliant light erupted, unleashing waves of intense heat alternating with the terrible cold of interstellar space. It was difficult for the observer to tell what was transpiring. Jehu managed to make himself heard over the ruckus, calling the guards to rush the stage. Now all could see that their queen needed no protection, but that, on the contrary, all the terrified congregation who remained needed protection from her. For the eerie swaths of alien light emanating from the opened portal began to take on physical solidity and to grab up struggling human figures, guards, priests, and worshippers alike drawing them screaming into a cavern-like maw. As his eyes grew adjusted to the bewildering fireworks, Jehu saw that not all the weird lights came from the dweller in the gulf. Many of the mystic bolts were generated like an exchange of spears or arrows between Jezebel, now revealed as a powerful magician, and none other than old Jonadab, who plainly possessed powers beyond even those ascribed to him by, prop by popular rumor. Jehu, sword in hand, leaped to the attack, hoping to add his all too mortal efforts to Jonadab's now waning energies. Jezebel, Baal's whore, gave him an ominous glance, which, lasting but an eye blink, effectively 
stopped Yahweh's champion in his tracks. Jehu had half expected something of the sort, but he hoped he had lent Jonadab, however narrow, a window in which he might be able to regroup and summon any reserves he might have remaining. Jonadab, too, gave his young protege a quick look, his hint of a smile implying Jehu's gesture had done some good. 5. Hell's Champion such was his fleeting thought, cut off by the sudden loathsome embrace of one of Baal's tentacles reaching through the portal. A shock of numbing cold passed through him, but it passed just as quickly, causing Jehu to breathe rapidly and heavily as he tried to comprehend the scope and nature of that which had seized him. He felt now a questing tendril of psychic menace, an imperious command to worship him. His head was spinning, but his mighty arm and instincts, his most trusty weapons, took over. The coiling appendage was perhaps double his own girth, necessarily no larger so as to hold him like a single finger hooking a smaller object. Jehu's sword chopped hard, two, three, four times, finally severing the boneless arm. As he dropped to the solid but rubbery ground of this awful space, Jehu was astonished to behold the cut-off limb quickly changing form. He felt his best choice would be to strike again while it was in flux, but found himself paralyzed by curiosity. The thing bubbled and shifted its mass, finally settling into a roughly humanoid shape, like the demon lovers of Jezebel, had he known it. But this one was possessed of a rather different lust, the lust for battle and for murder. Jehu brought his own warrior fury to the match. He charged at his foe, very glad he had earlier received Jonadab's blessing, or magic spell, on his blade. The demon appeared solid enough. A sword could connect with it, but it might be invulnerable to mortal armaments. Still, that no longer described the sword of Jehu. Jehu opened and hoped to close with a powerful blow to the creature's skull, evenly between the two mis mismatched horns. As he had hoped, the head split like a coconut, but in a moment his grin of exultation yielded to slack-jawed shock as each half of the ruined head expanded into a whole new head, both with laughing mouths. Time to switch tactics. The two-headed devil advanced upon Jehu as quickly as he could, yet hampered by an apparent lack of coordination due to the makeshift character of his body, as well, perhaps, as the novelty of his newly individual consciousness. It was a simple matter to evade this foe despite his obvious might and fury. The Baal avatar would rush and stumble punch and claw with poor aim. It occurred to Jehu that the thing might in fact be confused by conflicting impulses from his two rival heads. The ancients located the faculty of thought in the heart, not the brain, but Jehu had never believed this. Were not the senses at home in the head? Then thought must dwell there as well. So Jehu decided to experiment. Again and again he chopped with his now glowing sword, splitting each newly emerging head as soon as it emerged. Sure enough, before long, the demon's scaly shoulders could scarcely accommodate the overburdening fruit of that infernal tree. Jehu's last blow was to the heart, assuming the thing had one.
At any rate, the freakish thing fell to the ground. It began to lose coherency and quickly soaked into the barren ground. The young warrior decided not to wait to see what else the anti-god might throw at him. He made for the open mouth of the gate of Baal and hurtled through it in a single leap. The supernatural battle still raged without, but Jehu was horrified to behold the sight of Jonadab suddenly turning away from his opponent and kneeling in prayer. What was he doing? Could he be making peace with his god, having surrendered all hope of defeating the witch queen? That spelled doom for sure, as the ectoplasmic tentacles from across the void continued to sweep the interior of the sanctuary. With every life it devoured, the bale thing visibly grew more solid, more defined, more real and more fatally dangerous. What hope was there if even the mighty Jonadab had failed? Jehu dreaded to imagine the devastation to be unleashed should the monstrous entity Baal pass completely over onto the earth plane, ravening unhindered. It must not happen. But where was Yahweh? Had he forsaken Israel? Worse yet, had his lord's enemy Baal actually vanquished him? The very thought seemed blasphemous, but no more so than the things he had seen this day. But perhaps the warrior's faith was not as strong as his great thews, for things changed in an instant. instant. In answer to Yonadab's supplications, or so Jehu surmised, a flood of sane and natural light, albeit very brilliant, penetrated the temple through the entrance hallway. A lone figure walked calmly along the path thus illumined. It might have been any bald and bearded man, but Jehu knew it must be the prophet Elisha. He turned his head to see Queen Jezebel standing still before Baal's altar, her arms no longer gesticulating but hanging at her sides. She too must have recognized the new arrival. As holy Elisha, whom most deemed no mere prophet but something more than human, approached the dais, he raised his hands in the same moment Jezebel did. Both sets of hands began to smolder, then to ignite, then to blaze with light. Jehu took advantage of the pause to hop off the platform again and to shepherd those left alive out of the building. They stood stunned by what they had witnessed, passive like cattle awaiting the butcher, but they did not resist Jehu's firm hand as he led them to safety. He remained vigilant, not wanting to lose anyone else to the greedy grasp of Baal's incarnate fury. But the thing's failing arms seemed to have stilled simultaneously with those of its priestess. With Elisha taking up the fallen standard relinquished by the exhausted Jonadab, the contest was no longer evenly matched. Plainly, the prophet was drawing upon a far more powerful source of mystic energy than that employed by Jezebel. The two traded blows of divine force, uh, only the least traces of which were evident to human senses. But it did not last long. Jezebel collapsed like a limp rag. Elisha paced over to inert form, uh, to her inert form. Life remained in it as spasmodic shivers attested. Um, behind her portal to Baal's hellish realm, uh, behind her, the portal to Baal's hellish realm was swiftly contracting. Before it could close entirely, the prophet made a gesture of beckoning, saying, Let the word of Yahweh through Elijah be fulfilled. 
His words crashed like lightning, nor did they go unanswered, for at once there sprang through the opening a pair of apparitions whose outlines were vague, but whose motions recalled the gait of hyenas. They fell upon Jezebel as she sought to regain her feet. One tore at her throat, the other at her abdomen. Her corpse fell back onto the floor, but the fiends were not done. As they eagerly licked up her freely flowing blood, Jonadab whispered to the returned Jehu, They are lean and athirst. Save your strength, my lord Jonadab, said Jehu, as he held the old man's form in his own mighty arms. Here, let me take you to safety, for this fane of the damned has but few minutes left. Great cracks were loudly fissuring the temple ceiling. He looked around for Elisha, concerned for the prophet's safety, but there was no sign of him. Six king and messiah the sun was the benign eye of god looking down upon the coronation of jehu the champion of yahweh his sister tamar weeping with pride and gorgeously clad in one of the late and unlamented queen jezebel's gowns was at his side they stood before the high altar of yahweh's temple at bethel in the shadow of the great golden bull once erected by his predecessor jeroboam to represent the invincible might of the God who liberated Israel from the house of Pharaoh's bondage. Many present, including the princess Tamar, could not help thinking that perhaps their new king was a better symbol of the divine power. But just now, that statuesque figure was kneeling before the sage Jonadab, the old man, who for the first time appeared to be weary and frail, defied the decorum of the occasion, refusing the elegant robes offered him in favor of his usual threadbare smock. But really, this was by no means unexpected, however stark the contrast with the golden circlet crown he now set upon Jehu's brow. He intoned the traditional formula, May Yahweh's spirit come upon you to establish your throne in righteousness like unto his own. King Jehu held the scepter of Jeroboam in his left hand and with his right raised up his sword, recently scrubbed clean of blood toward the heavens. I will tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, Thou art my son. Today have I begotten thee. The gathered congregation broke into shouting and clapping. The acclaim died down as soon as the king resumed speaking, this time his own words, not those prescribed by ritual. You are my people, my flock. As your ruler, I shall tend to your welfare with a gentle crook to lift you up, and with an iron rod when it becomes needful to enforce the law of Moses and Joshua. You shall not serve me, but I shall serve you as Yahweh has commanded. Know this, my love for you, the people of God, will be matched by my hate for his enemies. We have won a great victory over the abomination Baal, but that victory is not yet complete, not as long as there lurk in Israel more of the followers of the false god. They must be eradicated if the cult of Baal is to be eradicated. We have had a small taste of the reign of Baal and of his servants. That is enough for me. Will you join your king in this crusade? Again, the roar of acclaim. King Jehu dismissed the rejoicing crowd, secure in the knowledge of the will of his God. Princess Tamar took herself back to her royal apartment, while her brother lingered in the holy shadows to meditate on his new responsibilities. 
Suddenly he found he was not after all alone. He saw no one, but thought he heard the familiar voice of Jonadab. Or was it Elisha? These were its words. Beware, O king, lest you become that which you hate. He turned about in an instant, hoping to catch sight of him who had spoken, but there was no one. Jehu shrugged and dismissed the matter. He had greater concerns to ponder. It ain't in the Bible, but it ought to be, I can hear you saying. Uh, yeah, so uh, there we go. That's uh, my version of the mighty Jehu. So let's see what kind of uh, comments we've uh, we've got here. There are plenty of them. Uh, Dirk says, hello, Bob. Hello, Dirk. Um, Yuvain says, tell us about Emmanuel after today's primary topic, please. Yeah, uh, one of the three sons of uh, Isaiah the prophet. In fact, uh, let's take a look at the text, shall we? I don't know if you're thinking of it. Let's go to the videotape. Uh, no, there, there is no such tape, I'm afraid. It sure would settle a lot of questions if there were. So, Isaiah chapter uh, 7. Now, I know this is going to be uh, uh, familiar to you. Oh, let's see. Uh, seven, one in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but they could not conquer it. When the house of David was told, uh, the, you know, the regime of the king, uh, uh, Syria is in league with Ephraim, or northern Israel. His heart and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And Yahweh said to Isaiah, Go forth to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed, be quiet. Do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria um, and the son of Ramaliah, because Syria with Ephraim uh, and the son of Ramaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up. Uh, against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabiel as king in the midst of it, a puppet king, right? Uh, thus says the Lord Yahweh, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass for the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it will no longer be a people, the Assyrian conquest. Uh, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So he's saying, look, you, you got nothing to worry about. These these kingdoms will, will be just detritus. Uh, in the junkyard when I'm done with them. But as for you, you won't be established in power anyway if you don't believe what I'm saying and count on it. Um, verse 10, and Yah again, Yahweh spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of Yahweh your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I, I, I will not ask, and, and I will not put Yahweh to the test. And he said, Here then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? You're not tempting God. What do you think you're doing? Um, uh, therefore, Adonai himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, 
He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. He can distinguish between food he likes and doesn't like. Uh, for before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before who to, whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Yahweh will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, namely the king of Assyria. Okay, in that day, Yahweh will whistle for the fly which is at the sources of the streams of Egypt and for the bee which is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and all the on all the passengers. Uh, in that day, Adonai will shave with a razor which is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria. The head and the hair of the feet, remember that's a euphemism for pubic hair, um, uh, and it will sweep away the beard also, as a sign of humiliation, uh, and so on and so on. Okay, so there is, what's the deal with Emmanuel? His name means God is with us. Uh, and so uh, when this happens, you'll think of my son, I think that's what he means, his wife is pregnant, and they're going to name the kid kid Emmanuel, so uh, he'll be a living reminder, oh yeah, if only I had listened when he made that prophecy. Uh, well, she or Jashub, now wait a minute, where was he? Um, oh, let's see. Uh, Sheer Jashub means the spoil speeds, the prey hastes uh, about battle and, and so on. Um, let's see. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, Sheer Jashub means a remnant shall return. Uh, and then. Uh, Oh, yeah, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so that was another one, one of his sons who he named for a prophecy. But here's an, here's the third one. Then eight one. Then Yahweh said to me, take a large tablet and write upon it um, uh, in common characters, belonging to Meher Shalal Hashbaz, which means... Uh, the spoil speeds, the prey hastes. And I got reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jebrekiah to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess and she conceived, that's his wife, him, Mrs. Prophet, and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, call his name, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, for before the child knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried before the king of Assyria. Uh, and uh, it's another prophecy about the same thing, right? Uh, here's another one. If one isn't enough for you, or actually two, uh, uh, how about number three, uh, Mike, Robbie, and Chip, my three sons. Uh, and uh, so that's what Emmanuel was uh, supposed to mean and who he was supposed to be, a living reminder of the prophecy uh, of, uh, of Isaiah, which had a challenge. Now, you got to believe God's going to do this. Uh, well, that appears again, of course, in Matthew, right, when he is speaking about the uh, the conception of Jesus. And uh, this gets pretty sticky uh, linguistically. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let's see. Oh, let's just start with Matthew 120. Uh, behold, an angel of, of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, uh, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Well, uh, what's going on here? Why didn't they name him Emmanuel? Well, because that's not actually what the angel told him to do, right? He said, you're going to name him Jesus, which is means Yahweh is salvation, because through him, God will save your people, right? And uh, But this fulfills, it's somehow a kind of anti-type uh, of, uh, of the same thing that... Um, that uh, Isaiah did when he named a son for a prophecy, right? It, so it may be a kind of a false problem that people have raised. I've raised it. You know, why doesn't he name him Emmanuel? Well, because you're leaving out the sentence before. Uh, so, uh, but Emmanuel was a son of Isaiah, and then uh, they invoked that example, Um on behalf of Jesus uh, in the uh, nativity story. Yuvain says hello, and uh, next he says, the flaming sword in the forehead is the symbol of extreme intellect. The flaming intellect needs to be cooled down in spiritual water, also known as being baptized. Then it becomes spiritualized intellect, balanced, uh, uh, the flaming sword in the forehead. Uh, that where do you get that uh, symbolism? You seem to be referring back to something. I hope I have not skipped. But yeah, there's not one there. But maybe you could elucidate a bit. Um, let's see. Richard says good day all, and then we've got the uh, Welsh backgammon. On the subject of spiritual water, what's the big deal with rivers? From the Nile to the Jordan, Tigris, Euphrates, Ganges, even the Juan Ganui for the Maoris, the deity sure do dig those rivers. Yeah, um, why would that? Well, uh, you can figure where ritual washing came from, right? That uh, it's a symbol to wash away ritual impurity or sins or whatever you want to call them. And uh, to uh, bathe in that uh, water will, uh, if, if it's believed it will cleanse your, your sinful pollution, then the water is holy and so the river is holy. So I guess that's sort of the progression of thought. Um, also, uh, it's believed that if there is a river in an otherwise dry place, just it's like an oasis. Why is this exceptional for, for being life-giving water when all the area around it is so parched? Well, it must be that some river spirit or river god uh, lives there. And uh, and cause and and has created it as a relief uh, for poor humans. I, I would guess. I mean, that uh, we're pretty sure that was why they. That was their explanation for why there were oases and groves of trees. Why were uh, like Abraham goes to various trees to consult God? Well, because. You know, they're not trees all over the place, just clumps of them, uh, palm trees, terebinths, stuff like that, uh, where there is a pool of water. And uh, so they figure, why there? Well, it must be a miniature Eden, uh, a garden for the benefit of some local god. And uh, so I think that's another, another big reason. Yeah, okay, let's see. Yvain says, scholars usually lump storm gods together, but Baal Hadad, who is Jupiter, is a rainstorm god, and Yahweh uh, 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 is Typhon, who is Mars, in a crazy mode, you know, berserker. The desert storm god, both are sons of El Saturn, as I understand it. Hmm. 
Interesting. Yeah, that I mean, you got more than one sun god per religion because there's different phases of the sun, the, uh, the red sun of dawn and evening and the, the golden sun up in the sky. Interesting. Yvain says to uh, 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 I guess is responding to Welsh backgammon. Why are so many women encounter, encountered at wells or waters in the Bible? Uh, it's a type scene as, uh, oh boy, blanking on the name. Jonathan Alter says, uh, you, you have this happen several times where um, Abraham sends his servant to find uh, a suitable wife from his own ethnic uh, tribe or whatever, uh, and he finds her at uh, drawing water from a well and asks who she is and so on, and she invites him home and so on. Uh, Moses, same thing. Uh, he's newly arrived in uh, Midian and uh, sees a bunch of jerky uh, guys uh, cutting in the line uh, uh, to get water to uh, uh, give to their sheep, but they're shoving aside these seven daughters of Jethro, uh, and uh, and Moses says, "Hey, what are you, what are you jerks doing?" And uh, disperses them and says, "Okay, ladies, be my guest." And so they uh, <laughs> they they thank him, <laughs> and they're all unmarried, and they go back home and tell their dad Jethro what has happened. And he says, well, where is the man? Surely you invited him to dinner, didn't you? Uh, and so, oh, well, no. Uh, and they go back and get him and bring him. And uh, he's hoping for a son-in-law out of this. And he gets one because uh, Moses takes a liking to, uh, to Zipporah. Right? And uh, same thing with Jacob, right? He goes to the east and uh, signs on as a laborer for his uncle Laban. Uh, and he happens to meet uh, his uh, his daughters and marries one of them and so forth. Uh, and then this pops up again in uh, John chapter 4. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. It was sort of a repeating scene, kind of a stock scene, you might say. And uh, there may be deeper symbolism to it. Um, Certainly in the Gospel of John, it, it's made to uh, sort of make the Jacob's well a symbol for Jesus who gives water that, uh, you know, you have, if, if you have a supply of that water, you will never thirst again. Not sure if that's uh, going on in the other ones. I doubt it. But uh, yeah, it's a type scene. They just find use for it again and again. Okay, let's see. We've done that one. Uh, oh, Richard liked the story. Thank you. Great story, he says. Thanks a bunch. Um, Yuvain says, um, the symbol of Jupiter is action, nerve signals. Mars is intellect or tactics. Interesting. Yeah, the gods all have roles right there. It's like a cabinet of the king. Yeah. Let's see, Yuvain says Mercury is the spinal cord where all nerves pass from the head to the limbs and organs. Uh, the messenger, uh, one snake, like the in the caduceus, one snake is magnetism, feminine, the other electricity, masculine. Well, yeah, you know a lot of interesting esoteric stuff. Dirk says um, uh, the Savage Sword of Jehu would make a great movie. Yeah, maybe so. Uh, uh, that'd be great. I could use the books. Uh, Richard says, Baal, also known as Nimrod. Hmm. Not, uh, not familiar with that. Very interesting, though. Well, yeah, because Baal, in this case, Baal Melkart was Hercules. And uh, Hercules might well be the uh, another name for the Semitic Nimrod. Interesting. Uh, Yuvain also says, great story, Bob. Thank you. Uh, hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Dirk says, I love the story. I'm not paying these people, by the way. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, flashing sword. Yes, right. I get it now. Yvain says a flaming blade of a sword uh, you find in Genesis 4, 23 through 24. Let's just take a look at it. Uh, 23 through 24. Come on, these darn pages. You know, I don't have any recollection of gluing every other page together, but I guess I or somebody must have. Uh. <laughs> man, oh man. All right. Hmm. Yeah, Genesis four, twenty-three through twenty-four. Okay, um, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Well, he is a uh, coppersmith or bronze, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, a Tubal Cain who furnished his dad with the weapons. He was a forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess you could call that a flaming sword if it flashes in the light. Oh, all righty. Um, let's see. Aaron Zach, the Syrian Orthodox Church, claims that the epistle to the Hebrews was originally written in Aramaic. Is there any truth to this claim? Uh I don't think so. I, like um, George Lamsa back in the 20s, uh, he did a translation of the Peshito text, which was the Syriac uh, version of the Bible used in the Assyrian uh, church. And um, I think he was just rooting for the home team. Uh, other scholars say, no, th this, uh, this Aramaic slash Syriac Bible uh, is a translation of the Hebrew and Greek. But the tradition understandably grew up in Syria and Assyria that it was originally, that theirs was the original version. It's a maneuver sort of like uh, Hellenistic Jews who said that when the, the Bible was translated into uh, to Greek, uh, that the translation was divinely inspired because uh, seven, 70 different guys worked on the whole Bible and they all agreed verbatim. Now, what are the chances of that? Well, of course, that's not the case, but it's a way of saying, oh, yeah, ours is the real Bible, not some derivative. No, no, I'm, I'm afraid it's a derivative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Low Rhymer, do we naturally worship fate actualized as God in and of itself? Every realization is God, therefore in real time, almost impossible to argue against fate itself being the one and only God. Let me take another look at that. I think, I mean, do we actually worship fate um, personified as God, but it's really just fate? Um, fate does seem to, it's a fate I gather is like karma. It's impersonal. It's an iron law that dictates events. Um, it, karma has to do with, uh, morality, right? Uh, you are setting things in motion by what you do, good or bad. There will be good or bad results and, and they will, uh, have an impact on you, but no God is in charge of it. Uh, fate is the same sort of thing. In in uh, in ancient Greek uh, mythology, even the gods were subject to the dictates of fate. They, they couldn't uh, defy it any more than uh, poor Oedipus could. Right, uh, and uh, so there's inevitability about that. You know how Jesus says at the Last Supper, the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, 
but that doesn't absolve the person that uh, that uh, trips him up. Right? Uh, that's um, how is it written of him? Well, I've always assumed he means it's been predicted in Scripture, as indeed it might. But it, uh, if it originally was not a statement about Jesus, but was a son of man saying about humanity in general, uh, then the point is uh, things happen as they must, as it is written in uh, the book of life. Because remember in the psalm, before I was even formed in the womb, uh, every one of my days was written up already like a diary in advance uh, in the book of life up in heaven. And uh, uh, so th who wrote them? Did God? Well, they probably did picture that, but it, there's very little difference between that and fate, especially if you're a Calvinist, right? Where it's unconditional election. There's no knowable reason as to why God sends one to heaven and one to hell, etc. And um, it's uh, if it's unconditional, like nothing has prompted it, I don't know what the difference is between that and fate. It's it's an ironclad uh, series of events that you cannot change. And uh, so did is God fate that he programs it in advance, though we don't know why? Well, that's just... Uh, no, it, it's fate, but God, God turns out to be reducible to fate, I, I should think. And so I guess I uh, agree with you. Let's see. Low Rhymer again. Uh, do we see parallels of the three Marys going to anoint Jesus as the three fates thwarted by his resurrection? Never thought of that. Wow. Of course, they're going to, well, yeah, uh, if the, if this was, if this was originally a parallel, even more than it already is, to Osiris, uh, where uh, Isis and Nephthys, uh, his, who are sisters and both wives of Osiris, they come to anoint the body to raise him from the dead. That's their intent, and it works. Whereas even in my reconstruction of it, uh, the the two Marys and Salome, Joanna, whoever else is there, uh, they figure, well, you know, they've given him up for dead, but they're just preparing the body so it will not decay so quickly. And uh, then uh, it... Uh, it works and he rises from the dead as Osiris did. Uh, he, there, um, if, that, if it were that parallel to Osiris, they're not really defying fate, but are the tools of fate to uh, bring about the ordained resurrection of the Savior. Uh, but I like the way you put it. Are they going to seal the deal to finish the burial? And lo and behold, he's alive. The three fates, yeah. Clotho, Atropos. And I can't think of a third one. But anyway, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Yuvain says Nimrod is depicted with a dog. Sirius, this, the dog star, is following Orion. Dogs are loyal and protective and man's best friend. Yeah, except that uh, he makes you uh, go out and follow him and uh, pick up his excrement. Uh, no thanks. No dog for me. I'll stick with cats. The litter box is bad enough. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, Yvain says to Low Rhymer, uh, the placebo effect, it's powerful. Now, what are you replying to there? Let me see. Yeah, I'm not sure what the reference is to there. 
um, Welsh backgammon. I'm looking for an accessible book on the old Canaanite stories, hoping that stories from ancient Ca Canaan, um, Coogan and Smith is going to do the trick. Yeah, I, I imagine so. I think so. Uh, there's also the famous one, the Babylonian Genesis, but that's probably just the Enuma Elish. Can't think of the guy. Uh, something Heidel? I don't know, but I think you got a good one there from what I know of it. Yeah. Okay. Yvain's is Sirius is two stars and one white dwarf. Uh, uh, in a reference to the two to three Marys. Uh, water is associated with this star. Hmm. Okay, I believe that's... Oh, oh, okay, Yvain says placebo may be the same as fate. Huh, interesting. And Lorimer then says, uh, maybe the placebo effect... Uh, is a more personal relationship with fate, but yeah, I meant it in a more universal sense. Okay, well, thanks for being with me, and uh, if you like that uh, biblical tale of sword and sorcery, uh, you can find at least more sword and sorcery stuff in my new anthology, Flashing Swords, number eight. It, you can look it up on uh, Amazon and just look up flashing swords and uh, numbers uh, six, seven, and eight are edited by me. One through five back from the seventies were edited by my mentor, Lynn Carter. And uh, we're reviving his, uh, his, uh, oh, oh, I see uh, his uh, series. And there's another one in my series before we decided to call it the Revived Flashing Swords, and that is the Mighty Warriors. And it's got a bunch of stories by me and, and several others. Uh, you'll be hearing another one of these from, this one from uh, uh, Flashing Swords 8, uh, featuring Simon Magus as a sword and sorcery character, and uh, that'll be on uh, the Gnostic Sabbath tomorrow at 4. Um, okay, Yuvain clarifies, he wasn't saying fate is a placebo, but faith was a placebo. I got you now, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Okay, well, thank you for being with me. I'll see you soon.